Hello, and welcome to the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum. We're happy you have joined us for this, the second session in our theme focusing on innovations in information and communication technology, ICT. I'm Gerald Shively, Associate Dean and Director of International Programs in the College of Agriculture at Purdue University. On behalf of the organizing committee, our advisory group, and everyone contributing to this effort, I'd like to welcome you. I'd also like to thank USDA, especially the Foreign Agricultural Service, for their ongoing support of these forum events. The goal of our year-long series of events is to explore the frontier of agricultural innovations with the goal of feeding the world sustainably. Central to this effort is supporting the resilience of smallholders, that is, their ability to withstand or bounce back from adverse events. Today's panelists will be discussing this topic and sharing their insights into the ways that ICT can help make smallholders more resilient. They'll also be exploring the roles of data, programs, and policies in supporting these efforts. To lead the discussion, I'm very pleased to introduce the moderator for this session, Dr. Michael Carter, Distinguished Professor of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of California, Davis, and Director of the USAID Markets, Risk, and Resilience Innovation Lab. Please enjoy the program, and please stay for the live question and answer session that will follow the presentations. So good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Carter, uh, and um, I'm here to moderate and participate in this session today with you. Let me first thank uh, Jerry, Peter Hurst, and the Global Agricultural Innovation Forum team for inviting us to share some of the work uh, that, that we've been doing in the Innovation Lab on this theme of ICT and smallholder uh, resilience. We're going to focus on three areas, and all of them are related to the fact that smallholder farmers are, by definition, small. Uh, and that puts them at a distinct disadvantage when it comes to certain kinds of, of transactions and information. So for example, we're gonna focus on how ICT and various digital technologies are changing the availability of insurance contracts for smallholder farmers. Traditionally, those contracts have not been available to smallholder farmers. And the problem is that the cost of verifying losses for a smallholder farmer are fixed, they're very large. And yet if the premium for that smallholder farmer is quite modest because the farmer is in fact small, uh, it simply does not work. So we're gonna look at uh, satellite based measures and other things that are being used to try to offer uh, risk management services to smallholder farmers. Uh, we're also gonna be looking uh, at another problem, which again, because smallholders farmers are small, the amounts they might want to buy or sell in markets are themselves small. Uh, this again creates barriers, makes it hard for a smallholder farmer to get very many buyers uh, interested in purchasing or selling to them. Uh, so again, ICT technologies offer potential ways for relaxing that constraint uh, and, and offering smallholder farmers better prices and more competitive markets. So we'll again look at some work that's been done on that. And finally, because smallholder farmers are small and information is an expensive, often a fixed cost, uh, has fixed cost elements to it, it may, it may be difficult for smallholder farmers to benefit from precision agriculture information. Uh, so we're gonna also look at new technologies that have been used to try to offer in a cost-effective way, a specific uh, information to smallholder farmers so that they might be better able uh, to, to cultivate their field. So I'll introduce each of the speakers as, as we come to them. Uh, but to begin uh, today, I'm actually gonna speak, I'm gonna speak to you uh, specifically about ICT technologies uh, and risks. So without further ado, let me jump uh, right into this. Okay, so again, I'm going to talk about using digital technologies and remote sensing to reshape risk management uh, for smallholder farmers. Um, the picture that you see in front of you comes from a comic book that we recently did in an effort to try to promote understanding and especially on promoting and uh, uh, these, these kinds of things to women in the northern 
Kenyan pastoralist uh, regions. Uh, we're not, I'm not going to talk about the specific project of making insurance relevant to women in these regions, but it's something we could certainly come back to uh, in conversation. So again, why are we talking about risk management uh, for smallholder farmers? Well, as uh, there's been generations, even since uh, Jerry Shively and I were young boys uh, studying economics, there was ample evidence that risk leads smallholder farm households to forego profitable investments and to engage in coping strategies that compromise their future well being. Uh, back in the 1970s and early 1980s, especially in Latin America, there were a number of efforts to use conventional loss verified insurance for the smallholder farmer sectors uh, in that region. Uh, typically, those pr programs crashed and burned uh, precisely because they proved to be uneconomical. It simply was not possible to cost effectively verify losses for many, many smallholder farmers. And in the typical case, those losses were not verified. And then suddenly, of course, everyone had losses and the in the programs uh, very quickly uh, lost uh, large amounts of money and become men became uh, non viable uh, economically. I'm going to talk to you now about index or parametric insurance. So index or parametric insurance is a type of insurance that does not require direct measurement and verification of individual losses. Instead, it offers payouts based on an index that can be that cannot be influenced by the insured party. It's related to, but not identical to the losses that are actually experienced by the insured party. And because of those features, it opens the door to insuring low wealth households, remote households, uh, and businesses, offering them insurance against, against various kinds of risks. So for the Kenyan pastor list we see at the left uh, in this picture, we devised a product we called index-based livestock insurance or IBLI uh, back in 2000, uh, back in 2008, uh, 2009. Version one of that uh, of that contract was based on satellite-based measures, basically of the green reflectance of the Earth. The uh, the graph the maps you see in the upper left show the same area in a normal year where the rains had been adequate, and a drought year. And as you can see, this is an actual representation of the satellite image, you can see there's very clear differences between them. So there's information in these satellite images that, that in fact we showed are, are highly predictive of losses of livestock mortality, et cetera. Over the years that product's been improved, there's a lot of use of artificial intelligence to design better contracts to allow earlier payment uh, under these contracts. And the entire system uses Kenya's very robust mobile money system called M-Pesa. So again, this is a population that lives in very, very remote areas, and they now actually purchase the they purchase the insurance using mobile money. Payouts are made uh, automatically without any visit visiting the area, either to make payouts or even to verify uh, losses. So it's a it's an interesting and 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 very challenging kind of idea. Um, and there's, there's ample evidence that when these kind of programs have been put into place, um, they actually have the kind of desire, they have the desired kind of effects. That is, they reduce households' reliance on costly coping strategies in response to weather. And in addition, by making households feel confident that they can manage the worst risk because of this financial tool, households respond in time and tend to increase their investment. In the innovation lab, we refer that to resilience plus, that it's an additional gain of making people resilience in that they then intensify their investment and increase their average incomes. We found, especially in cropping systems, that when index insurance is provided to small scale farmers, uh, increased investment occurs at a level that basically in, improves incomes for those smallholder farmers by something like 20 to 30%. So that's a very large jump in the incomes of, of families that are living often in very modest uh, kinds of circumstance. And this modest jump is coming simply from providing uh, re better risk management tools to these farmers. Now, as I, I think for these kinds of reasons, there's justifiable excitement, excuse me, <clears throat> about the potential for index insurance to enhance social protection and reduce uh, food insecurity, especially in the face of climate change. Yet despite this excitement, index insurance is a work in progress. The greatest strength of index insurance, as I've already said, is the fact that losses do not have to be verified for each individual. 
And yet this strength is also the Achilles heel of index insurance because the index uh, may not actually accurately reflect individual losses. The graph you see to your left there is just an example drawn from some early index insurance contracts in India. If those contracts had worked really well, they would look like the solid, uh, thick, dark blue line that you see there when the state of the world is good. So over here, we see when farmer yields in an area are, are above 100% above normal, right? There should be no payouts. And as things get worse, payouts should go up. But this line down here is actually a statistical estimate of the relationship between payouts, payouts that were made uh, and, uh, uh, and the state of the world. As you can see, that line is very, very flat. In fact, that line almost looks like a lottery ticket. If you were selling farmers lottery ticket, there would be no relationship between what kind of payouts were made on the lottery tickets in the state of the world. So again, we've, we're doing better than this now, but it remains uh, it remains a problem. And our next speaker, Lily Ndungu, is going to come back to this uh, as as we go along. Now, let me just say a little bit more about the evolution and and why things are getting better and why there's hope for improving this. Uh, let me not try to explain this complex diagram over here on, on the left. It comes from a recent Nature Reviews paper. But there's very, very rapid technological advance uh, in remote sensing. The, the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution of these indices are improving. So spatial resolution means uh, uh, over how small of an area do you are you actually able to make a reading. So the diagram I actually showed you for the Kenyan pasture list if we had zoomed way in, we'd be able to look at those maps and see little pixels. And those little pixels in the initial rendition of that contract were actually five kilometers by five kilometers. So that is in a 25 kilometer square, you were getting one reading. Now that can be very uh, provide very weak protection, especially for crop farmers, where there might be a lot of variability within a 25 kilometer square radius. Now what we're seeing here is since since those early since those early satellites that went way back, uh, like the MODIS satellite that you see here goes back to the year 2000. Some of the earlier satellites went back as early as the 1970s. Their spatial resolution was quite coarse. Uh, the current winner of the spatial resolution is actually a, a, a mini satellite product from a, from a company called Planet that actually gives you up to three meter by three meter pixel resolution. That is, you're able to get a reading on an area that's only nine square meters, which is, uh, is in fact smaller than the typical farmer's field. So there's new sensors, there's new way of using the information. Flexible machine learning is being used to, opt to find better ways to relate these kinds of, of exotic uh, remote sensing measures to actual farmer outcomes. And finally, let me give you, I'll give you just another example here. There are also contractual innovations. I'll talk about fail, sell, fail safe audits in just a moment, but we also have work that you would using drones and even using the kind of photography you can take with your cell phone to provide, um, to provide more accurate uh, measures. So here's an example. If you focus on the diagram of the left, this shows a recent uh, index insurance contract we did uh, for farmers in, in, in Mozambique. The little, the little dots you can see are actually data points that represent different villages and years. The green dots are good years, the red triangles are bad years, and the other ones are something in between. The red triangles were bad enough years they were supposed to trigger uh, payments. Payments were then to occur when our satellite measure, shown here on the vertical axis, was less than 60% of normal that should have triggered payment. And it looks like most of the bad years, in fact, were correctly captured by the satellite. But you can see, if you look carefully, there's a few of these red triangles that, that escaped uh, issuing payouts. That is, the, thing, the, the, the satellite simply got it wrong. Over here, you see a similar diagram uh, from Tanzania. And again, it, it actually performs much less well. So what we did in this particular project is we told farmers, we set up an SMS message system and said, if the satellite incorrectly predicts what happened to you, we will come and do an audit. 
to make that audit more cost effective, we developed a system, again, using ICT technology to more quickly and much and cutting roughly in half the cost of doing a crop, a crop cut audit. In the interest of time, I won't go further into that, but the photograph on the right is, is simply a representation uh, of how that kind of technology was used. So to summarize, there's justifiable excitement about the potential for insurance to enhance social protection, reduce food insecurity, especially in the face of climate change, but it remains a work in progress. It's a non-trivial issue. Uh, the technological frontier is there, we're making rapid progress, but we need still clear concepts of quality and minimum quality standards. So we're gonna turn now to my colleague, uh, Lilia Nadungu. She works with the uh, Regional Center for Mapping of Resources uh, uh, for development. It's a NASA affiliated a regional remote sensing center. The uh, Lillian has been working along with the Innovation Lab over the last few years to help define and implement quality measurement standards. So let's turn without further ado to Lillian who will continue this theme of, of, of what we need to do to improve this very exciting idea of index insurance. So thank you very much. So over to Lillian's presentation, please. Greetings, my name is Lillian Dungo and I'm joining in from Nairobi, Kenya. I work at the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development as the thematic lead for agriculture and food security. RCMRD is a premier institution that has been offering geospatial and geoinformation related products and services to its over 20 member states in East and Southern Africa for the last 40 years. And today I want to talk about the role of standards in strengthening index insurance as a key resilience strategy for smallholder farmers. African agriculture, as we know, it is especially vulnerable to weather related extremes such as droughts and flood. And the impacts of these extreme climatic events present challenges that extend beyond the farmers to other stakeholders in the entire agricultural value chain. But the smallholder farmers whose livelihoods are dependent on agriculture face multiple risks beyond the climate extremes, challenges such as accessing financial services and inputs. And with the growing availability of medium resolution uh, satellite images, index insurance is increasingly being recognized as an important a risk management tool against the impacts of climate change and variability, and also in its role in enhancing the resilience and economic autonomy of smallholder farmers. Index insurance avoids the cost related to assessing and validating uh, policyholder losses and minimizes the moral hazard and adverse selection problems, given that the policyholders cannot affect the distribution of payouts exams and the historical distribution of the index is observable to both the insurer and the policyholder. But index insurance faces two main challenges. Design risk when the insurance index is purely correlated with the average losses in the insurance zone covered by the index. And also idiosyncratic risk which occur when the individual losses differ from the average losses within an insurance zone. And when an insurance contract fails, it can become double tragedy for the farmer. And the worst that can happen actually happens because the farmer who buys insurance becomes more confident, assuming that he has cover for bad days. And due to this confidence, he invests more and takes larger risks. And when it rains, it pours, or in this case, it doesn't. The index insurance sector is growing with different products emerging, responding to the insurance use of different user groups. And governments, especially, are subsidizing insurance for smallholder farmers or offering it bundled with inputs. Our CMRD, through a partnership with the University of California, Davis, is implementing the Quality Index Insurance Certification Quick. In the last three years, a working group consisting of all the necessary stakeholders from insurance companies and consortia, regulatory authorities, government, insurance, International representatives have been involved and consulted in the implementation of QUIC and on its viability as a critical tool in evaluating the value of insurance products. And the goal of QUIC standards and certification is to help create a viable insurance market based on a minimum quality standard. 
but to also support the improving of contracts and employing technological advances to create high quality insurance indices. But the most important aspect of QUIC is that it allows all the stakeholders to tell if an insurance product will benefit them or not. The minimum quality standard uh, ensures that the economic well-being of the insured is no lower with insurance than without insurance. Or more formally, the certainty equivalent of the insured's income stream with insurance is no lower than the certainty equivalent of their income stream without insurance. And the NQS combines the economic principles and the power of remotely sensed data sets validated against field data to identify the minimum thresholds for a properly contracted insurance contract. And then it evaluates the ability of the contract to take trigger when failure occurs. And an insurance product passes the test if it exists the MQS. And the whole goal of having quick and an MQS is, is to ensure that there is a form of standard that allows farmers and governments to make the best decisions if they're seeking to subsidize um, the insurance to shield its farmers um, from the extreme events, but also for insurance providers who need to create effective products. Because a well-designed insurance contract benefits all the stakeholders uh, involved. And the questions we want to ask with Quick is, would the farm household be better off going it alone without insurance, or would they be better off with insurance? And if the household would be, eco would be better off economically buying insurance, then we will say that the insurance contract meets the minimum quality standard. And so we are saying that Quick helps us measure the value of insurance in barriers because an index that fails often does not meet the NQS. And then we can also look at this from the perspective that the value of insurance to a farmer is also based on how much they're willing to sacrifice in good years to provide them with a cover in bad years. In short, a farmer's risk aversion significantly increases the probability of their decision to buy index-based crop insurance. So how does Quick run or how is it envisioned uh, to run in the long run? Users such as insurance companies would submit the request to, for certification to the Quick Certification Board, which includes the insurance regulatory authorities, who then submit the request for certification to the Quick Technical Lab at RCMRP. And the evaluation is done and the results submitted back to the Quick Certification Board. Right now, we have been receiving um, contracts for certification from partners who are already part of the working group. And the certification process begins by having the insurance companies or the partners requiring this evaluation to provide data on individual losses such as yield and livestock mortality. And then this data is cleaned and statistical methods are used to fill in sparse data. The quick algorithms then subject the data through a historical prediction model that predicts how well the data is able to determine losses in bad years. Then the utility or measure of well-being of a household is computed. And this reflects the welfare and accounts for risk, for example, the possibility of bad events happening. The next step is to calculate the certainty equivalence, which is the risk discounted value of a household's income. Or to put it plainly, the value of an amount of money during a bad year compared to a good year. This is because insurance improves the utility value in a household by ensuring that they are covered in, in bad years. The MQS then tests the accuracy of the insurance contract in detecting loss in bad years. But Quick goes beyond evaluating if a contract passes the MQS or not by exploring through simulation possibilities of better outcomes from the insurance contract. If, for example, different like the right indices are used as input, if they would improve the performance of the insurance contract. And another example is to also provide a better indication of why an insurance contract has failed the MQS, for example, due to mispredictions or due to differences in performance of the insurance across the different insurance zones or unit areas of insurance. And so this is how having standards can improve the way that 
that um, the index insurance uh, products are being evaluated or approved, but also by making sure that the products that are being put out there and that uh, farmers are investing in and governments are investing in meet their needs. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Lillian. And Lillian will be with us live in the question and answer period. That was, um, I hope that really brought out clearly for us a lot of the challenges and promises here. A lot, lot there to talk about, Lillian, so thank you. So our next speaker is Lauren Falkel Burquist, who's gonna talk about the promise and limitations of a mobile phone boast agricultural uh, commodity change. Lauren is a professor of economics at the University of Michigan. She works in development economics, especially on market efficiency, trade and agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, she'll again be speaking to us about, I think what was some of the most innovative work we've seen in the, in the markets risk and resilience uh, innovation lab. So Lauren, take it away. Hi there. Uh, my name is Lauren Berquist. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. And I'd like to talk to you today about the food price dilemma. So the food price dilemma is a dilemma faced by policymakers uh, who are searching for both uh, higher prices for, uh, for farmers uh, to encourage higher income for farmers, but also lower prices uh, with the goal of having more affordable food for consumers. So how do they achieve these seemingly contradictory goals of wanting both higher and lower prices? Well, one solution is potentially to promote more integrated markets. Okay, so a quick Econ 101 review here. Why are prices often quite low for, um, for farmers who often live in sort of rural or majority surplus areas? Well, it's because supply is high, right? And that's gonna lead to, to low prices. Why are prices often quite high for, um, for sort of, uh, consumers who often live in urban deficit, deficit areas? Well, that's because in those cases, supply is low and therefore prices uh, are high. Now, one way to potentially both increase prices for farmers and lower prices for consumers is to move grain from surplus to uh, deficit areas, okay? That's going to both raise prices in rural areas and lower them uh, in urban areas. So how can policymakers promote more integrated markets? Well, one potential solution is to make it easier for buyers and sellers to find each other, okay? To make it easier to transfer that supply from surplus to deficit areas. And one uh, new and exciting potential innovation here to promote that easier uh, um, matching process is to offer agricultural commodity exchanges. So places where buyers and sellers can post what they're looking to buy and sell, and then having a centralized location or clearinghouse that can match the two. So I wanna to talk to you today about one such commodity exchange um, uh, that uses technology very heavily. And this exchange is called Kudu. Um, it's a mobile phone-based commodity exchange uh, in Uganda. So let me tell you a little bit more about how Kudu works. Um, uh, so farmers or any sellers really of agricultural products um, can post the platform, the crop they're looking to sell, the quantity, the price and their location. Um, sellers do the same and the platform matches them. Now this really heavily uses technology and that it's a mobile based exchange. So the way that farmers um, uh, or users can use the platform is either by, as you see here in this figure, um, uh, texting into a short code and using a USSD dropdown menu or by sending a free form text message that gets automatically parsed or by calling into a call center. But it's really relying heavily on the mobile phone uh, infrastructure that's um, uh, now quite ubiquitous in Uganda. Um, and, and the goal here is really to be able to reach sort of the um, last mile farmer, maybe I should say first mile farmer, right? To make it easy to access for even smallholder farmers in remote areas. To further promote access, uh, the system also um, uh, employs local agents uh, as you see here on the right graph to, or figure to, um, uh, to promote the platform and to train users. Now, what is the impact when you introduce this platform on kind of at a macro level market integration and at a micro level uh, farmer welfare? So we evaluated the impact of Kudu using a large scale evaluation, uh, a randomized controlled trial uh, covering 12% of Uganda. So we had control in treatment communities and in treatment communities, we uh, randomly promoted the platform. And that's gonna allow us to look to see what happens to a variety of, of market and farmer outcomes. Okay, so what do we find? So what we see is that in treatment communities or in areas where Kudu was introduced, we see first increases in market integration. 
So we see increased trade flows. We see a, a higher probability that two markets are trading with each other uh, when they're both connected on Kudu. And we see higher volumes of grain flowing between those, those markets. We also see, as a sign of greater integration, reductions in the gap in prices between those markets, right? Remember that first graph, we see sort of a convergence of prices across, you know, surplus and deficit areas. Um, and how big are they? Well, when two markets are connected um, uh, to Kudu, we see a 15% reduction in price dispersion, so pretty large. Uh, on the other sort of uh, plus side, we see an increase in competition. So we see higher numbers of traders operating along trading routes that are serviced by Kudu. Um, and potentially as a result of this increase in competition, uh, we see a reduction in trader profits. So it seems like it's increasing competition and cutting into the market, uh, the markups of some of the intermediaries um, uh, who exist in the market uh, in the first place. Okay. So those are sort of on the positive sides. But there are some limits to this, uh, this, this platform. So I want to remind people to sort of, uh, you know, one of the goals of this platform is really to connect sort of um, uh, remote, rural, smallholder farmers directly to markets, directly to buyers and say, capital cities. So first, we're not seeing that sort of direct connection, right? We're not seeing that it's directly connecting remote rural markets to capital cities. Instead, we're seeing that really all of the increase in trade flows that we observe uh, is concentrated in fairly nearby or neighboring markets. And why is that? Well, it's because the system, though it's solving this problem of, of matching or search, making it easier for trading partners to find each other, it's not solving the physical transportation costs, right? So roads are still um, often a fairly low quality, transport costs are still quite high. Um, and so, you know, that's gonna limit sort of the ability uh, to do long distance trade, even if buyers and sellers know about each other, right? It still might not be worth it to directly transport to Kampala from a remote area if transport costs are high. The second is in terms of who benefits, right? So we're seeing limited use by smallholder farmers. So the platform's open to everyone. Uh, and we actually see much higher usage by traders, by intermediaries, than we do farmers. So in our in our areas that where we introduce Kudu, 80% of, uh, of traders uh, try the platform, use the platform, only 24% of farmers do. And then even among farmers, you know, who is most likely to use, it seems to be the largest farmers. I mean, the farmers who have a large enough surplus that it's sort of worth it for them to go through the hassle to learn a new technology, to post the platform, and they're more likely to match because they've got a big enough surplus that it's worth it for a buyer to come out to them. Okay, so we really see as a result that most of the benefits in terms of things like increases in revenues and increases in quantity sold are concentrated among the largest farmers. Okay, so I want to dive into sort of why there are these limitations and what can possibly be done um, uh, to expand the benefits for smallholder farmers and overcome some of these challenges. So what are sort of the, the challenges preventing trade um, or limiting market integration? Well, one, and this is one that I think technology or at least mobile phone technology can, can address quite well is search costs. It's just difficult for buyers and sellers to find each other. That we think Kudu does really, really well. Where it's sort of less effective is in three other challenges that I'll now describe. So one is aggregation. So I mentioned that, you know, many of these farmers just seem to be too small to make it worth it to learn a new technology, or it was difficult to find a buyer when they were only selling very small surpluses. So the platform actually did try to do, uh, we tried out a system of what we called electronic or e-bulking where it would say, okay, maybe you individual farmer have a very small surplus. It's not worth it for a buyer to come out. But what if we can say on the platform, we can see there's say four other farmers around you who are selling at the same time. And we could tell the buyer, hey, there's five farmers in this one area. Maybe individually, it's not worth it to send a truck, but together it could be worth it. Now, unfortunately, our setting this did not work very well. Um, we think that may potentially have to do with the fact that the platform was new uh, and hadn't yet reached sort of the density of users or the market thickness necessary to have enough people in one area who are selling at the same time. So farmers, when they want to sell, they really want to sell on that day. Um, and it was difficult to uh, get this level of aggregation. You might imagine, um, uh, you know, a platform with deeper market penetration could, could get there. Uh, the third issue is contractual risk, right? So agricultural trade is risky in general. It's 
particularly risky on a platform where you're trying to match with new trading partners that you've never met before, right? It's one reason that people often like to trade with folks they already know um, uh, in person and have had repeated interaction with. So we tried to mitigate contractual risk by offering what we call a transaction guarantee, where you know if a buyer is sending out a truck and he shows up to a rural village and things, either the quantity isn't there as promised or the quality is lower than described, that we would reimburse a portion of their transfer cost. This didn't seem to uh, increase buyer uh, buyer take up of the platform too much. Um, you know, one thought there is maybe they didn't trust us, the platform, any more than they trust each other. You might imagine that if, say, it were a government-run system, they might have more faith in things. Um, the other thing to note is this required, of course, having staff in the field there to verify uh, if things had gone wrong, and that starts to cut into some of the benefits of kind of a lightweight, mobile-based uh, approach. And then finally, quality grading. So describing quality is very difficult on feature phones. Um, people don't really use uh, sort of at least outside of, of capital cities or large markets, don't use sort of formal grade. They instead use a variety of both words and also physical touch uh, and taste to see the test the quality of the grain. That's difficult to communicate over a feature phone. Um, and further, it's difficult to communicate credibly. So you might imagine if people were using smartphones, you might be able to take a picture but how do you know that picture is really of your, say, maze rather than your neighbors? So there's additional issues that Kudu wasn't able to address, um, but these are issues um, uh, that potentially could be addressed by a, a new potentially promising solution, which is um, government run or even private sector run uh, uh, full scale commodity exchanges that off also offer some sort of in person component. Okay, so they all often offer wraparound services to try to address those issues of aggregation, contract risk. Um, and quality grading. So things like, you know, they'll have physical warehouses to do aggregation. They'll have people stationed at those warehouses to do quality grading. Um, and they'll address issues around contract risk by doing things like holding money in escrow until transactions are completed. Um, so we are currently, um, I'm currently involved in a project that is uh, evaluating um, some of the services offered by the Ghana Commodity Exchange. So hopefully in a few years time, we'll have some results uh, on the impacts of um, technology plus uh, in-person services. Okay, I'll stop there. Looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. And we questions have already been popping up, so don't worry. There'll be plenty uh, to discuss. So our final presenter today is Chris, Christopher Magomba. Uh, who's going to talk to us about effects of soil information on smallholder farmers' agricultural investment and productivity. Uh, Chris is a professor at Sokoin, uh University of Agriculture in Tanzania. Uh, he works a lot on agricultural commercialization in Tanzania and is especially active in the area of looking at inputs and input qualities across the Eastern African uh, region. So without further ado, let's go right away uh, to Chris and his presentation. And again, thank you, Chris, for joining us. Hello, um, my name is Christopher Magomba. I'm a lecturer at the College of Economics and Business Studies, Sokoyin University of Agriculture. And uh, today I'm going to talk uh, briefly about our work that we did in Tanzania, in Morogoro, on the effects of soil information on small scale farmers, agricultural investment and productivity. Uh, this work was done jointly by the University of Maryland, University of Columbia, uh, Sokoin University of Agriculture, University of Illinois, and University of Florida. And we were motivated by the uh, problem that our farmers are facing, including poor soil quality and limited use of mineral fertilizer. Uh, that contributed to low agricultural input, uh, sorry, low agricultural productivity and pervasive poverty uh, in much of the rural sub Saharan Africa. But also, uh, our motivation was also triggered by the extension services advice, which are usually advise the use of fertilizers, but may not recommend fertilizer types that address uh, prevailing soil deficiencies. And this way, uh, it makes farmers to apply fertilizer blindly and uh, resulting in the perception that fertilizer is not profitable. So uh, we believe that uh, based on our knowledge, this work uh, is the first 
first of all, to start the, to investigate the interaction between information about fertilizer and ability to finance fertilizer purchases uh, explains whether or not farmers apply fertilizer or, um, and this uh, applying fertilizer means uh, investing in the plots. But also our work was, uh, was one of the, I mean, was the first work to estimate the effect of plot specific information on fertilizer use and crop yields. Uh, this is mainly because farmers may not invest in learning whether fertilizer is profitable if they do not know which fertilizers are needed in their plots. Um, and also uh, we believe that information may not increase investment if farmers are financially constrained. So in this study, we addressed both information constraints and also uh, financial constraints to, to farmers. We use the, an innovative tool known as Soil Doctor, or uh, shortly it, called, it is called the Soil Doc. Uh, this is a, a lab in a box developed by the, uh, by the University of Maryland. Dr. Ray Whale was the innovator of this uh, tool. And this tool is embedded with the ICT to provide plot specific recommendations in real, in real time. Uh, a portable, it is a portable on farm soil testing kit and it, it can measure both biological, chemical and physical conditions. And currently the results are highly correlated with the lab results. So we use this result, this to, uh, kit, soil doctor kit, to measure or to test soil in the uh, in the plots in all farmers' plots. And our stud was RCT. I mean, used the random control trial, whereby we had a treatment and a control group. So we had a total of uh, twenty villages, which are were treatment villages, and the thirty villages which were control group. Within the treatment, we had two components. Component number one was uh, plot specific soil management recommendations based on the soil doctor kit. Uh, and uh, component number two was uh, we provided farmers with a voucher. Uh, that is, the value of voucher was 40 US dollar, which can be redeemed for agricultural inputs. And uh, we treated these farmers. Uh, in the treatment villages, whereby we had 40 farmers, we divided 40 farmers into four, so having 10 farmers in the group, whereby group number one of the treatment farmers received soil management recommendations, group number two farmers receives uh, voucher, group number three farmers receives both soil uh, management recommendations and a voucher, and group number four these were left to be a treatment within, uh, sorry, were left to be a control within treatment village. And these control farmers and other control farmers in the control villages receives uh, soil management recommendations at the end line. And we collected the data um, two times in the two webs, baseline survey and the end line surveys, and also uh, agronomists took soil samples, collected soil samples in the plots and tested it at the, at the lab. Now, uh, I want to talk briefly about the findings, what we, we found. Um, first of all, as I've said at the beginning, uh, we found that uh, there is effect of information and liquidity on fertilizer purchases. Uh, this is because uh, during the baseline, 80 farmers out of 1,000 farmers reported uh, to apply fertilizer. But at the end line, this number increased up to 249 farmers who purchased fertilizer. So uh, farmers, those farmers who received the voucher or recommendations and the voucher are the ones who purchased the fertilizer. So we, we can even see here that farmers were really constrained financially. Um, another important uh, info, uh, findings that we, 
we, we got is that uh, of the value of information. We found that farmers who received uh, voucher plus information were more likely to buy fertilizer that relate to their soil's specific nutrients deficiency than farmers who received the voucher only. Uh, actually, those farmers who received the voucher only were complaining to us saying, why are you giving money without giving information to use this uh, for our plots? So uh, info, the value of information is really important here. And we see inform information is very important because uh, we found that information increases the propensity uh, of applying fertilizer, but also the amount of fertilizer applied. And also farmers may be applying types of fertilizer that have, have, have large impact uh, on yields. So uh, we could say generally that information about soil fertility can help to close farm specific nutrient deficiency gap. Another important finding is that about yields. We found that um, uh, our data show that farmers who received vouchers and recommendations have high yield uh, relative to those farmers who received nothing. So we, we see here the effect of information and voucher. And so farmers who are, didn't receive anything, their yield were more or less the same. So to end my presentation, I want to, to give you some takeaways points. Uh, number one, plot specific fertilizer recommendation increases fertilizer use and maize, ye maize yields substantially among smallholder farmers. And, but only this is only possible when vouchers that cover the cost of the increase in fertilizer accompany the recommendations. That means uh, together uh, information and voucher is very relevant because financial constraints are real among most smallholder farmers. Um, we could even, uh, we are recommending the policy that programs that provide plot specific fertilizer recommendations together with assistance uh, with purchase fertilizer should improve farm productivity and profit. So uh, this is what I wanted to, to talk to you today to present what we, the experience that we had in our study. Thank you so much, Asante Nisana. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. So um, let me first of all remind uh, all participants to please uh, put your questions into the Q&A. Uh, box. A number have come in already, so we'll go ahead and get started. But we've left ourselves, I believe, ample time uh, uh, for questions. So I see the speakers are putting themselves up. Lillian, are you there? Are you able to put up uh, your, your face as well? Great. So welcome, everybody, uh, and, and thanks. So I'll go ahead and uh, uh, get us started with just a couple of questions that have already uh, come, in to, uh, come in. So one of the questions was actually about trust, and uh, several of us have, have mentioned us, and, and others have not. So uh, the question really is how do, you know, these are often exotic technologies. And I mean, I showed a picture in my slides, there was a group of pastoralists sitting there, and they were, they were listening uh, intently, at least as intently as Lauren's students look at her Econ 101 graph that she showed us, but they looked slightly stunned, right, as they were being explained. Uh, uh, about these exotic technologies. So trust is, is clearly an issue. So Chris, let me start with you. You did not mention trust, but is, did you all find trust to be an issue for a farmer? Some, some person shows up with a backpack and says, oh, you need uh, you know, so, many, so much zinc and so much boron and, and so much NPK or whatever to make your crops really yield. Was trust an issue in terms of farmers valuing the information? Um, yes, I could say, because uh, uh, initially, I mean, before, the, before our start, we had some farmers saying uh, they don't apply fertilizer, and the most reason that they don't apply fertilizer is the belief that they have uh, on fertilizer. So they even don't trust the information given by the extension agents. 
so I could say, yes, the trust is, a, is an issue. Uh, though it didn't come out very clearly in our in our study. Okay, great, thanks, Chris. And Lauren, you you, you spoke quite specifically about about trust and some of the things that you tried to do. As you sort of reflect and think back, um, what do you think the major barrier is to create trust in, in that kind of electronic uh, trading platform that you described to us? Yeah, so I think one of the big challenges is they have to trust, um, you know, not just us, the technology providers, but also each other on the platform. So in particular, you know, one of the main goals of this platform is to introduce farmers or any sellers of agricultural commodities to new buyers they haven't worked with before. So inherently, you're asking them to try to break out of sort of the existing relationships they have. Um, and in those existing relationships, they've built up over seasons and years, they've built up that trust, and they don't have that um, when they're matching with new buyers. So it's even a bigger task to actually try to, um, you know, with technology, basically um, fill that trust gap when they're matching with new buyers. There's a bunch of ways that people have thought about doing this. So, um, you know, if mobile money were more ubiquitous, which unfortunately it's not sort of, you know, it's not used as much, at least in Uganda outside of, uh, outside of Kampala, um, you could imagine doing things like holding money in escrow. Uh, mobile money just wasn't feasible um, sort of for the typical smallholder farmer. You could try to build up trust on a platform by sharing things like reputation. So for example, you could build up a rating or a score um, to say, you know, maybe I haven't interacted with you in the past, but you've interacted with other people on the platform. You know, have you been reliable in those cases and build up a review that does take some time to develop. Um, you know, you only get a reliable rating after some time. Um, and then we tried various things like actually trying to provide insurance products. It seemed like those didn't do much. And then you're stuck with the question of, you know, is that because risk isn't a problem? I sort of doubt that. Uh, or because maybe they didn't trust us any more than they trust each other. Yeah. Okay. And and I'll say just a word if I if I could about trust and, and index insurance, because Trust is a huge issue there. If you, you know, you can think about credit as a potential way to deal with risk. I, I might be able to borrow money after a disaster and therefore deal with the, the consequences of the disaster. But to borrow money, the lender, the financial, the financially powerful power partner has to trust me. But insurance, it's reversed. I, the person that suffered a loss, has to trust the financial, that the financial partner will actually pay. Um, I think index insurance, one thing I th think we've come to realize is a really heavy lift asking farmers to start there because the consequences of, of, of failed payment or even a failed index, and Lillian gave us a lot of insight into this, are, are, is, really, is really quite consequential. So in some new work we're beginning in the lab, we're trying to offer a set of bundled financial tools that are all indexed, but some of which are a lighter lift for farmers. So for example, you can index savings accounts, the, for risk management, you can index uh, uh, lines of credit, and we're we're hoping that farmers can begin to learn how these how these tools work with with sort of simpler to understand, in a sense, uh, and tools that are less are less consequential when things go wrong. So we're we're hoping that that kind of learning process. Uh, and going maybe a little slower. And, and while insurance offer can offer the most comprehensive protection to people, it, 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 also, it also has the highest requirement in terms of trust. So I think there are things we can do uh, in education we can do. Uh, Lauren, I think you mentioned some really interesting things about having people on the ground who can you know, certify things or, or whatever. I think we need to really put our thinking our thinking hats on, maybe, maybe for all of these uh, uh, technologies. Uh, let me let me uh, jump to a question to Lillian. So, Lillian, I'm wondering, you know, you're a remote sensing specialist. As you sort of look forward, and I know you work on both uh, crop insurance and and livestock insurance. What do you see to be some of the most interesting technological innovations that might be coming that could potentially make these products uh, even more trustworthy? Thank you, Michael. Um, one we are seeing an increase in, um, in, in the resolution of uh, the satellite, the free satellite images. So the, the opportunity to improve uh, the design of index insurance using the new 
uh, um, a higher resolution or the, you know, kind of higher than what we are using right now. Um, you know, we have sentinel coming up and being uh, more available. So there's a role of, you know, better satellite uh, data that is available in improving the design of the image insurance. But also you mentioned the role of um, satellite derived outputs in reducing the in reducing the need for audits or in transforming and developing hybrid products that take advantage of the uh, value of uh, the satellite data to reduce the cost of implementing insurance. But we've also, like in Kenya, worked with the Ministry of Agriculture to improve the delineation of the insurance both using other observations. So making sure that the data that is being used to define production areas is also um, depending in part from a GIS or a satellite based uh, output. Uh, for example, the climate on the map. So I think all those opportunities that we can leverage on. Okay, great. Thank you, Lillian. Um, Chris, another question that came in specifically for you, and I think it's a great question. Uh, in your in your randomized control trial, you had a group that only received information without the vouchers. So the question was, how did how did people in that arm of the of the experiment work? That is, did the simple provision of information uh, without uh, any financial uh, in, you know subsidy was that effective at all? What did you all learn about that? You're muted, Chris. Okay, yeah, I was uh, sorry, I was I was on mute. <laughs> yes, um, can you come again with the with your question? Sorry, yes. Mike. I, so, so yeah. what happened? You had an arm in your treat in in your experiment where there were people who only received the soil doc information. What was the effectiveness of just the pure information treatment on farmer use and demand uh, for for fertilizers? Uh, okay. Yeah, um, those who receive the information, especially those who are in, in the control villages, they actually were, if, if I want to, to be very specific and open, they were more happy, I could say, compared to those who received cash only, because the information uh, that they received changed their mind and even change their perception to know uh, what type of fertilizer they should apply because the information given was telling them uh, the, uh, the deficient, deficient uh, in the fertilizer, even the pH level. So uh, I could say they, they value that information and we, we gave in a, in a card, in a very special card, having a logo, Sokoino University logo, and um, Columbia University logo, and the recipient name, uh, et cetera, in the village. So to me, I think this information was, was more important for them so that they can even use in the, the next season. I, I, I think I have tried to respond. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Chris, while we're with you, one another question that came in, was about soil moisture, and it really had two parts. And so one was asking, you know, can can farmers without irrigation really reliably benefit from fertilizer? And the, and the second was, does the soil doc technology that this backpack mobile lab you were using, uh, did it actually measure uh, soil moisture? Um, um, maybe I can start with the second one, which is the easiest. Uh, the answer is yes, because that uh, soil doc kit measures uh, biological, uh, physical, and chemical properties. So it also measures the, the moisture of the soil. And the, the first question uh, was on the... Um, just the you know the reliability of returns to insurance in non-irrigated settings. Yes, uh, on the irrigation. Yeah, in most in the areas that we we conducted our our, our study, 
we first of all targeting maize and uh, the the aim was also to see uh, farmers who are cultivating maize during the la- the long rain season so uh, I, I believe irrigation is also important but uh, most farmers uh, they didn't complain about about uh, rain so the the rain during those three four years was was more or less constant also important in connection to fertilizer in order to to realize uh, high yield uh, on the on the farmer's plot. Okay. Yeah, and if if I can uh, just just add to that um, with actually with one of Lauren's colleagues, we recently published a paper on 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 fertilizer subsidy coupons and their long short and long term effectiveness. Uh, in Mozambique. And in the first year of that study, we distributed voucher coupons to farmers and there was actually a drought that pushed yields to about 40% or or less than normal. So farmers that actually got the coupons for fertilizers had actually lost money because it required co-financing. And I think that actually brings together uh, the, the issue of both risk management and, and soil fertility amendment, because I think in the in, in the end for farmers who do not hate irrigation, those are actually probably a highly complementary, uh, highly complementary interventions. Um, let's see, in terms of some other questions that have come in back to you, uh, Lauren, uh, you know, you mentioned in your in your recording that people were able to access the platform using just a feature phone. I'm curious in the areas where you were working and more generally uh, in the areas where you have worked, do you think there's sufficient cell phone tower coverage uh, that allow people to use this? That is, are there are the technological requirements really there for, for people to be able to use this? Is, is even the spread of feature phones as opposed to full-blown um, uh, smartphones, is, is that widespread enough that you think this could make a difference? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, let me say if there were smartphones everywhere, there's a lot more you could do. And I'm happy to chat about that. But, um, you know, you could you could take pictures of the quality. You could do kind of probably a, um, a better version of kind of electronic bulking. There's a lot you could do there. But we knew from the beginning that this was not going to be something that was feasible. So, yes, yeah, so the entire platform of Kudu is, is accessible via feature phones. But you're right. You do need, you know, cell phone tower access. So a couple of things. First, I should say we selected the area where we ran this intervention partially based on that. So in terms of where there was access, um, my understanding so in our in our study area, there's pretty widespread access. That's not true of everywhere in Uganda. Um, my understanding is that, you know, reception is is um, uh, is present in the majority of areas. But is it reliable? I think that's another question. And, and, you know, here having reliable reception is really crucial because, um, you know, a lot of farmers, when they want to sell, they really want to sell immediately, especially if they're selling, for example, to, you know, pay a medical bill that's arisen or something else has happened urgently. Same thing for sending out, for example, price information. Price information is really a sort of real-time thing. Um, and so people want to know, you know, not was the, what was the price a week ago, but what is the price today? So I think, you know, my, my very rough answer is that I do think the cell phone tower access is good enough to, you know, to, to do at least sporadic outreach to farmers. If you want to do super, um, high frequency, real time collection, that's when these sort of outages, I think, become more of a problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, I know in the um, the areas in northern Kenya, I mentioned we launched that insurance project uh, back in 2009. At that time, in that area, you there was one place, a sort of very large hill. And if you wanted any kind of cell reception, you had to go on the hill and sort of hold your phone up. Uh, but it is amazing how quickly that has changed. Actually, the first payouts that were made under that contract back in 2012, they actually had to be hand-delivered 
And the insurance company in Kenya that sold the product is actually still holding in escrow funds for people they could never locate. I mean, that's been almost a decade, right? They, they could never find the people. And pastureless, of course, are, are extremely difficult. But that's all been replaced. Um, and we sort of started this in the hope that cell coverage would respond, would uh, improve rapidly. And it really has, even in, in one of the more isolated parts, uh, parts of the world. Um, a lot of questions here coming in on on, on sort of limitations. So Lillian, let me, let me turn to you. I know you also work advising and helping the government of Kenya with their crop insurance programs. As you've been working on this and other insurance pro programs, what do you think some of the key limitations are to farmer farmers adopting uh, insurance? What, what, what sort of strikes you as you as you ponder this space? Yeah, I think the the biggest limitation is the lack of understanding of what the insurance presents. So then that creates a gap and to be filled, but also the gap between this complicated world of, you know, what the insurance means and the jargon to something that, you know, the farmer can use to say that, you know, this is the quality of this uh, product or not. But apart from that, I think uh, there's also a lack of trust in the product, and especially this because even when insurance has been implemented, sometimes it has failed the farmers who have taken an insurance. And so that creates mistrust because they, they really don't understand how this is going to be um, an insurance product is going to shield them. But I'd also say that it's an issue of risk aversion. Are the farmers willing to take their willingness to take a risk and uh, make an investment in good years to shield them in bad years? You know, they sometimes feel that you know they'd rather hold on to what they have and you know, just whoever they stops when they come. Um, so I'd say those are the three main challenges. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's right. And 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 if I could just offer some thoughts on some of those. Uh, limitations as well. And we've had a number of questions about some of the specifics uh, around agricultural insurance. Um, be besides the ones that, that Lillian has mentioned, sort of trust and understanding, I think one of the other challenges, and it's one we've been researching as a lab, is how do we as human beings actually process risk and, and think about things? So economics has its sort of stylized way of, of, of thinking about human rationality, and yet lots and lots of laboratory experiments show that people often don't actually behave Surprise, surprise, and maybe thank goodness, people often don't behave in the ways that economists uh, like to imagine. So there's a very interesting set of work that's been done that tries to understand how, how do people actually process information on risk? How do they think about risky prospects? And, and then if you start to understand that better, how do you begin to devise insurance contracts um, that actually perhaps resonate more with the way we as human beings uh, think about risk. So to give a concrete example, we we in the lab did some work a couple of years ago uh, in West Africa and Burkina uh, Faso. And one of the ideas that's come out in, in what's called behavioral economics, that is trying to understand how people actually behave as, a, as opposed to how we think we might behave, is that people really value certain things in a disproportionately large way. A bird in the hand is worth way, way more uh, than, a, than, a, than a bird in the bush. And so thinking about that, we realized that, you know, one of the things we always stress to farmers, particularly in the interest of education and promoting trust and understanding and all these things we know are important, is that when you purchase an insurance contract, you must, with 100% certainty, pay the premium. And then maybe, you know, maybe you'll get a benefit, maybe you won't, it depends on the years. Now that's true, but by emphasizing the fact that premium must be paid with certainty for people who have what economists call a discontinuous preference for certainty, this can be very discouraging. So we worked with a bunch of cotton farmers in Mali um, and we found that in fact, about 40% of the population had a strong or so-called discontinuous preference for certainty. And we did a set of experiments 
where we reframed the contract and we made the premium itself uncertain. That is, we offered a premium rebate kind of structure, which was actually a feasible thing for these to do with these farmers because of the value chain that they were in. And we found that for farmers who had this kind of strong preference for certainty, that reframing the contract and offering a premium rebate uh, actually was incredibly effective. Right. It, it like doubled the purchase of insurance by farmers who were told, OK, yes, you have to pay the premium, but don't worry, it's an uncertain thing. You'll get it back in certain states of the world. And although the contract was identical to the conventional framing, simply changing the way we talked about it in a way that was more consistent with the way many of our psychologies actually work had a major, major impact on on, on how these farmers valued uh, value the insurance. So I think that's another, another kind of frontier issue. Um, let me put a question to the group as a whole that's come in. Uh, there, there's been several questions sort of talking about getting uh, youth in rural areas involved in some of the technologies and things that we've, uh, we've been discussing. So let me put it out to all three of you. Any thoughts that you've had or experiences that you've had in terms of the involvement of, 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 of young people uh, in, in these kind of technological project progress? So uh, Chris, Lauren, or Lillian, any, any thoughts on, on that? To break the ice, I'll ask Chris to start, if you don't mind, since you're first on my screen showing people there. Any, any, any thoughts? That, I know you were doing a pilot project, but as you think about this, how might this fit into the broader sort of age structure of employment, et cetera, in rural areas? Yeah, maybe I could say, uh, actually, ICT and technology, uh, definitely, I mean, in the in the sense of uh, mobile phone and other technology is highly adopted by youth. Uh, more youth is in the villages are having these smartphones uh, while elder people's, older people are having the, the normal phones which you cannot surf or you cannot use WhatsApp. So to me, I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for, for us as a researcher to use technology, especially to youth who are in the villages. The only problem it, uh, I think, especially in, in these sub-Saharan countries will be the, the finance, uh, the financial constraints, uh, because some of the, most of these youth is they do not have maybe uh, employment and some of them, they do not have, uh, of course, cash, to, to use those mobile phones. Um, and also uh, another problem that can hinder youth is, or village, people in the villages to use ICT is the infrastructure. Some of the villages are very far from the communication towers. I think, uh, is it Lauren or Lillian has talked about communication towers? Some of the villages are very far. so. Even, even though youth is in those particular villages might be interested to invest in technology, they cannot do that. But um, all in all, I believe uh, the use of, for example, the soil dock was really, um, I mean, people are very happy to see the results and to see that this is a lab that is moving and a farmer can, can, can call the extension agent to come to the plot and measure the, the soil and to see the results in real time. So the issue of uh, not waiting is just a real time. I think is a one thing that in technology uh, will, uh, will uh, attract people, especially youth is because you know youth is, uh, they, don't, they don't want to wait. They just need something to, this time and then in five minutes they get the results then they apply so that is my my take <laughs> <laughs> sounds like people have been paying to playing too many video games chris before you before you go i want to follow up do you think could um uh if you and lauren had some money to invest in a in a, in a business do you think this is the kind of could soil doc be something where with a a smallish investment an individual could actually make a business out of providing soil doc services 
uh, in their community and surrounding area? Or is the, is the technology actually something that's manageable by someone who doesn't have a deep scientific uh, background? Um, no, I think it, someone has to have a basic knowledge and that's why most of these mobile labs are, are used by the extension agents mm -hmm. uh, in the villages. So someone has to have that basic knowledge, then he can use. Maybe the, 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 the cost of using it in terms of reagents, you know, you have to buy some reagents to, to do the testing. So that is also another thing, accessibility of these reagents and also affordability if these farmers are, can afford to, to do it. But otherwise, I think most of farmers since 2015, after we did our, our surveys, most farmers are keeping calling us saying, we need, our, we need to test my farm, my plot. I need to know the, uh, what type of soil I have in my farm so that I can plant specific crop. So that is, uh, I could say, is, um, is, a, is a thing that farmers are, are really needing. Okay. So there's a demand, but maybe not yet the capacity of supply. Lauren, did you have any thoughts on the involvement of youth in the, the kind of trading platforms and other things you've been thinking about? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So we certainly see among, um, you know, among farmers, we see that it's the younger farmers who tend to adopt, which is, you know, probably not surprising in terms of familiarity um, and comfort with technology. Um, you know, one thought that comes to mind. So one thing we did that was not terribly successful is we tried to have, um, in addition to just the technology platform, we tried to have um, sort of in village promoters of the platform um, who are going to both sort of make people aware, do sensitization training um, about the platform and also do a little bit of this. I had mentioned this electronic bulking thing where they could potentially be offered a line of credit and then they could bulk and that might sort of overcome some of the challenges of some smallholders getting onto the platform. So the, the, this, this, this approach of having kind of these local agents was not very successful, partially, I think, because we had initially chosen, um, perhaps stupidly, to work with existing traders as those agents with the thought that these are the folks who are kind of connected to farmers, new about agricultural trade, et cetera. But these folks have also a vested interest. Um, they use the platform themselves for their own trade, but they were not great at promoting it to others. So it's an interesting thought, you know, could you potentially work with, you know, non-traders, uh, youth just from the general area, but who, you know, do have a comfort with technology um, to potentially use the platform. Now, I will say things like how do you how do you compensate and pay these youth? So, for example, there is a model, right? So M-Pesa has these sort of mobile agents. I think that would be sort of a model we'd move towards. But with the technology, you know, because mobile money is not... Um, uh, super prevalent, at least in rural areas in Uganda, Kudu itself has struggled to figure out how do they become sustainable? How do they make, you know, currently they're not making commissions on these trades. They'd like to eventually, if they're making commissions, they could share them with kind of the youth agents, mm -hmm. but without mobile money, it's actually hard to kind of intervene in any way, charge for that. So I think there's some again, technological challenges to making kind of that commission structure work properly. But it's a nice idea. I do think kind of the youth are folks who are most comfortable with trusting of technology um, and certainly are in need of employment opportunities. Okay, great. Thank you. So looking at the time, let me, um, Lillian, rather than ask you about that, let me, let me come around to a number of questions that have come up about subsidies, both for fertilizers, but also for insurance. Lillian, I wonder if you might start us off about questions about affordability of insurance uh, for farmers, for pastoralists. And I, I know in Kenya, the government has some rather specific programs. Perhaps you might tell us a little bit about what you see to be the frontier there in terms of, of insurance subsidies. Yeah, I forgot to mention in your earlier question that you know, affordability is also the other reason that has actually affected the cost uh, has affected the uptake of insurance. And um, for the most successful programs, I'd say in the region, there is either um, a bundling or the use of other observation to reduce the cost, the implementation cost. Or again, uh, more popular, uh, the government um, subsidizing the insurance for the farmers. And for countries like Kenya, you find that it's subsidized for 
farmers who have less than 20 acres, uh, those ones will pay 50% of the cost of the insurance in the focus. Uh, by the government in Kenya is uh, maize for the cropland, but it's also the, the livestock insurance um, for the pastoral areas, and again, that's also subsidized. But there are also private models that are also working well. But um, as I say, that the cost of insurance is one of the biggest uh, prohibiting factors if it's sold as, you know, as, um, as, as um, a separate product instead of these uh, innovations where it's uh, part of um, a credit model or part of the subsidy program. Mm -hmm. I know um, there's a gentleman, Dr. Hassan Bashir, who was involved in some of the early marketing of livestock insurance in Kenya. And he believes that a lot of problems, and we've had questions here on malfeasance and in insurance contracts. He thinks that some of the worst problems occur when people uh, are, are too heavily subsidized because then the individual insured client, um, you know, has no real stake in what goes on if someone gives them a payout grade, but they're not really monitoring or thinking about it and, and not really demanding, uh, uh, not really being demanded by, a, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, by, by the farmers themselves. I think this is a really, uh, I think this is a really a very, very important kind of question. There also been questions coming in about competition in these insurance markets. Uh, some countries, I know we're, Lily and I are doing work in Uganda right now. There's an agricultural insurance consortium where the companies are actually pooled and there's some government oversight uh, of the insurance. But again, um, Lily and I are working with them, the kind of quality certification that Lily mentioned, which we think is really, really important. The Agricultural Insurance Consortium is looking for independent third party verification of the quality of the contracts that they're actually uh, subsidizing. Um, one thing that I think is real, you know, when we talk about subsidies, and Chris, let me kick over to you to stay on this theme for a moment, because we had some questions about that. How smart, in quotes, how smart were the voucher coupons that you gave to farmers? Do you have any idea whether they learned from the subsidy and then continued to buy the insurance in future years, or was it kind of a once-off thing and they said, thank you very much? And then just went back to doing, you know, the only 89 people out of a thousand who were using insurance. Was it back to that the year after the subsidies ended? Any ideas on that? Uh, okay. Uh, how smart our 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 program? We wanted it to be a little bit different from the the old national agricultural voucher uh, system uh, input system. Uh, whereby it, it failed in most of the areas because the farmers used it to uh, exchange uh, fertilizer with cash and then or exchange fertilizer with the other thing. And sometimes the, the management of it was very uh, problematic, especially uh, having an, a, political, a political issue. So ours was very... I mean, it was open. Farmers uh, knew that they have that voucher worth the 80,000 shillings or 40 US dollar. And we also relaxed the, the accessibility constraints uh, by sending the agro dealers to every villages. So the, uh, the farmers were even given information that tomorrow, so and so agro dealer will be here to for so for you to redeem voucher. What we did with the redeeming of the voucher, we allowed the farmers to exchange to to redeem voucher for cash or voucher for fertilizer or for any other input. But if they redeem for cash, they got less. Uh, we deducted some amount so that to discourage farmers to redeem for the whole amount of of, of cash. So. Uh, what we know, some farmers really bought fertilizer and the other input, but uh, I don't know whether maybe it's, a, it's an, a follow up study that whether these farmers are, were continuing to buy uh, to buy fertilizer. But what I know up to this moment, the information that we gave up to this moment, farmers are keeping calling us saying, "Okay, we want the same information to my another plot, my another plot." So maybe the value of that information was very important. 
Uh, the voucher, yes, farmers are, are having financial constraints, but uh, maybe the program, the government should design a program that embed both uh, information and uh, credit together. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just mention that uh, I alluded earlier to a study in Mozambique where it was a one-time uh, subsidy. And what we found is we followed the farmers for two years following the subsidy season. And, and we actually found a slight drop off, but really there was genuine learning. So I think as we, as we think about subsidies, um, you know, one good use of subsidies is actually to facil facilitate learning or to lessen the cost of learning. And in that Mozambique study, I think it was very important. Um, you know, one thing that's really challenging in the insurance area is that if you subs if you were to subsidize someone for just one season, if nothing bad happens, they don't actually learn anything about the insurance contract and whether it's reliable. So one of the things we're trying to work on in the lab, and by the way, everything I mentioned here, if you go to basis.ucdavis.edu, you can find these different uh, projects for more information. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things we're trying to figure out is how do you do smart subsidies for something like insurance or even drought tolerant or stress tolerant seed varieties where the benefits don't reveal themselves in, in, in the sort of typical year, only in the atypical uh, year. So I think that's very much a frontier to figure out sort of how to do that, how to do that uh, better. Uh, we're almost out of time here. I was asked to let you all know that on October 12th, there will be one of these uh, GAIF forums that's going to specifically uh, focus on youth issues. Um, I know the four of us could talk for another couple of hours on these topics, but I gather from the messages that I'm getting, it's time to wrap up. So let me first uh, thank Chris, Lauren, and Lillian for, for joining us uh, uh, in this venture today. And let me thank the Purdue team for inviting us. I hope you found this useful and uh, we certainly look forward to following up. So uh, uh, Jerry, did you have some final uh, comments for us? Uh, no, that, that brings us to the conclusion. Thanks again to all the participants, the thoughtful questions, and uh, we um, encourage everyone to share the, the link to the recordings and, and to join us for future events. All right, great. Well, thank you. And I wish everyone a good day. <laughs>